We are on part number 37 of, or 38 of Understanding the Kingdom. And uh, it's been a wild week. I got to uh, do an interview with Steve Quayle on Hagman and Hagman Monday night, and it was a blast. It was probably the, the quickest hour and a half I have ever experienced in my life. And I think one of the things I'm going to do this next week is I'm going to download that entire interview. They did it in video and upload it to our, our Biblical Life channel so that folks maybe not, don't know to go to, uh, to either Hagman and Hagman or Steve Quayle. But there's a lot of things coming. A lot of things beyond our imagination, but they're not beyond God's. I think that's one of the reasons why it is so essential for us to learn how to move in the kingdom, because we're going to have to face things that the early apostles didn't. The most advanced technology that the early apostles in the book of Acts had to face was the end of a Roman sword. That was it. We have the Internet of Things coming, we have 5G, we have synthetic DNA, we have all these different things that, that really smack of Genesis chapter 6. But Jesus told us, as he stood in the front of Mount Hermon, that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. That means there's things available to us to begin moving in that kingdom so that we can function to withstand these things and to, and to get the job done that we're supposed to do here on planet Earth. And so with all that said, I want to go to Acts chapter 1, verses 6 and 11. And I want to continue our conversation that we started in the last session a little bit. Uh, we're, we're coming up to Shavuot, and Pentecostals have, and I being charismatic, and have been charismatic since the uh, late 70s. So I'm saying this not from someone looking on the outside, but from someone looking on the inside. We have reduced, hear me, we have reduced the baptism of the Holy Spirit to speaking in tongues. And so here God has given us a battle cruiser, and we're getting all excited about the lug nuts on the wheels. And we have specialized in the lug nuts, but one of the, one of, I guess one of my problems is I have been so long in the church, I have seen too many people that have spoken tongues that had no fire and had no power. Because they sought an experience instead of yielding to a relationship. Let's pick up here in verse 6, and I, I want to show you some things this morning if I can and kind of knit it together. And it says, when they therefore had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he said unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which, are, uh, which the Father hath in his own power, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be my witnesses, or ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly uh, toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? The same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Now we need to set this back in, in historical context. All of, the, all of the Jews were looking for Messiah ben David. They wanted the conquering king to come and to get Rome off their backs. Not realizing there was a greater power than Rome. It was the kingdom of darkness. And so they're still asking the same questions that they were asking before the crucifixion. But you've got you to you put their minds in this. Okay, he has now conquered death. He can translate himself anywhere he wants. He walks through walls. Death can't hold him. Who can come against a king like this? Are you now going to begin the millennial reign? Are you now going to transition from being Messiah ben Joseph to Messiah ben David? Is the question that you're asking. We now want your physical kingdom. We want the millennial reign. We would like to have it right now, please. This is, this is awesome. 
you know, we're moving into Pentecost. We want, we want this. We want, we want the shav, We want this. The Shavuot to be like Mount Sinai because, to a Jewish mind, Mount Sinai is where God established His reign and made the nation of Israel. When Moses brought them up, that it was that day they became a nation that was in covenant with God. What a perfect setting, and it was just a few days away. And he says, now listen, he said, no, this, this, chill for a minute. The day that the millennial reign is supposed to start is in the hand of the Father. <laughs> because they hadn't got it yet. Jesus, when the Pharisees were demanding of him, when's the millennial reign going to start? When are you going to start being Messiah, Ben David? In Luke chapter 17, 21 and 22, and I've quoted this so many times, he said, you, you, you're going to say, you know, the kingdom of God is here, the kingdom of God is there. He said, look, the kingdom of God is on the inside of you. It's got to first manifest on the inside of the hearts of men and work out its program before it can ever be established on the outside. That's one of the things I think that, that Christians have missed a lot of this, is we're, we so... We so try to get men uh, trying to act like they're walking in the kingdom by legislative laws that we pass on the books. Now you can have those within a community that everybody's walking in the kingdom because it's an expression of the hearts of men. But if you get enough of these guys that aren't working with God, they can simply march on Washington and change the laws because they want, although we want the laws to reflect what God's done within, they want the laws to reflect what the devil has done within and bring it in into synchronicity. And so Jesus is saying, oh, you know, when are you going to bring the kingdom? And he says, now look, the, the establishment of my physical kingdom is in the hands of the Father, but in Jerusalem you will receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit so that you can be my witnesses in all the earth. In other words, your task before the kingdom is established in the millennial reign is to go forth into all the earth and bring the kingdom within the hearts of men. That's where we're missing it in America. We can't elect a president and change the hearts of men. They will do exactly what they're doing now. They will rail against him. Because there's a communist movement, there is a coup going on that is a rejection of everything of Christianity right now in America. And so we could, we could elect senators and they would rail against them. We, can elect, we saw that we elected a president, we finally broke out of their mind control. We elected a president and they're trying everything. They were calling for impeachment before he ever took office. And one of the interesting things is probably for the last 20, 30 years, he's probably the first president that was not initiated into the Bohemian Grove and approved for the presidency that we have had in decades. And so the whole satanic system is rebelling against him. But that isn't going to change America. Does it help to have got, you know, men in office that aren't a part of the, the secret societies? Yes, it does. But what we've, we, we have forgotten that if you begin changing the hearts of the people, See, that, that's what the communists have done. That's, that's what these Luciferians have done. They, they have set our schools of higher learning to change the heart of the youth to where they are running toward socialism. They are running toward communism. Mark Zuckerberg, in a, in a, in a, in a um, speech he gave at the commencement speech at Harvard, even though he was a dropout, talked about, every, you know, robots are going to replace everything so that you're not going to be able to have any jobs. So we're going to have a universal base salary for everybody. In other words, we're going to put everybody on welfare. How well has that worked out for people on welfare? Now, I'm all for helping people during a time of need, but you should also move them toward because your self-worth isn't sitting in a chair watching TV all day drawing welfare. It is learning your purpose in the earth and to have the creative force of God to flow through you that adds worth to your life. Now what we forget is the Nazi party was the National Socialist Party. They wanted universal health care. They wanted complete gun control, sound familiar, and all these things. Once they got universal health care, it opened the door to, to uh, eugenics, which also developed a term called 
called eaters. All you are is a eater. You contribute nothing to society. You're just living. You become a parasite on the system. If you're disabled, however that happens, you know, whether it is uh, some type of mental defect or a physical defect, and they begin wiping out those people because they were draining the system. That's where we're headed. Well, on the outside, it's how, oh, just universal, universal health care. Who's going to pay for it? Well, the, one guy even said, well, the robots will pay for it. All the robots that are taking our jobs, they're going to pay for it. That's what happens when you want $15 an hour working at McDonald's, guys. You're about three years from being replaced. There will be probably one or two people staffing the entire store. Everything else will be automated. Those that are building cars while we still have them, that the ones that you can actually drive, they're wanting $30, $40 an hour plus all these benefits. You're about four or five years from being completely replaced. That all automobiles will be made, via, be made by automation. In China, the, even the, the company that builds the iPhones and all the computers that we buy, they're looking at within three to four years of replacing all the workers with automation because automated robots can work 24 7 they don't need to have time off they don't gripe about getting more wages all these different things there's so much going on we're facing all of this and we don't know that that what they have done is they have prepped the people for destruction what we're supposed to do is prep them for the kingdom by the preaching of the gospel there is a greater way. You see, what, what they want when it's all said and done is to reduce the population of the earth to 500 million, which will all be the bloodlines of the elite. And I think they're actually planning on replacing us serfs because us serfs will raise up and have revival. Us serfs will raise up and write something called a constitution, which has been a thorn in their flesh. And so what they want to do is replace us with automatons. At the same time, have they ever watched Terminator? Just saying that, you know, eventually if you create the singularity and you make them smarter than you, that you could end up being the endangered species regardless of what family you're a member of. But God is, but Jesus is saying, listen, you need to go out and we need to preach a, the full gospel. It's not the gospel of salvation. That's a small component of it. It is the gospel of the kingdom that we need to bring the kingdom wherever we are. Now let's go to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. I want to bring out some things in the baptism of the Holy Spirit that I didn't really know existed there until I put this together. And it fits. What's interesting is, you know, God has me on this track on the kingdom. And the deeper I study in the Word, I'm... It is kingdom from Genesis 1 all the way to the very last chapter, very last verse in the book of Revelation. It's all about having that kingdom come. And one of the things that's amazing to me, and this is something to think about. God has a rebellion in heaven that he had one of his highest angels rebel, create a new power force called the iniquity force. He began to have angels fall. It destroyed a lot of creation here on the planet Earth. God had to recreate it. And so God's solution for a fallen angel was to create a man that would yield to that fallen angel. And in the process of redemption, not only would he get a people that were faithful to him, he would take care of the angel that fell before he even created man. I'm not kidding when I'm telling you that God, op, God is playing 12-dimensional chess while the devil's playing checkers. That Lucifer himself... God constantly is surprising Lucifer. And Lucifer, the Bible says that if he would have known, he would not have crucified the Lord of glory. He actually thought he wanted the cross. He got up there and said, King me. And God said, Checkmate. We need to understand the power of what's going on. And now God is calling us into this kingdom that is greater than anything the kingdom of darkness can do. But what, he, what, what Lucifer has labored to do is to keep us ignorant of the kingdom. 
We constantly are reducing things down to churchianity or just getting saved and to park your blessed assurance on a bench somewhere holding your little golden ticket for the rapture or to get to heaven when there's so much more involved. When we start walking in the kingdom, you can be like Abraham that you are living in a promised land filled with all these pagans and they're worried about whether you're okay with them or not. When Abraham came back up out of Egypt and they saw that he was coming back into the land, they went to him and said, we're all right, we're cool, right? They were worried. When Israel, even when they were wandering in the wilderness, when the, as long as that pillar of fire was coming up out of the top of the, of, the, of the tabernacle, the nations around them feared. The reason that paganism does not fear the church is they have taken over 99% of the church, they have corrupted the gospel, they have corrupted the word, and there's no real fire, only the strange fire of the Nechesh. So with that in mind, let's go to Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, and they were all in one accord, and suddenly there was a sound from heaven as a muddy rushing wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as unto fire, and it sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And everybody has centered in on speaking in tongues. It was a sign and a wonder at the initiation of what God was going to do. And it was also replicated in the house of Cornelius. To the, and and it, was, it was a sign and a wonder even to Peter. But what everybody forgets about is the fire. That fire is so essential. Because it was in the garden, man chose another fire. It was the Nechesh of the garden that brought in the first batch of strange fire. And the heart of unregenerated man longs for that fire to this day. That's why the sons of Aaron were immediately killed by God because they were reenacting the garden when it should have been a christening of the tabernacle of Almighty God. Because they offered strange fire, fire that was not given by God to men. And so now on the day of Pentecost, you have them born again when Jesus said, Receive the Spirit of God, and he breathed on them. Here we have the Creator, the one that held Adam in his hands when he created him and breathed life into him. Now you have that same resurrected God standing in front of him and blowing on them saying, receive the salvation that I just came to give. And just a few days later, now fire is coming on them because the, in, in the, throughout the entire Old Testament, the fire that was used, once you established a priesthood, the fire that was used was always given by God. God gave the fire. They, they didn't rub two sticks together to get it to light for the first sacrifice. It was the fire of God that they maintained. That's why the sons of Aaron went for convenient fire from the Nekesh rather than the fire from God. And even in, in Pentecostal circles, we confuse the fire. There was a song that was popular not too, uh, not too long ago that says, uh, You keep the fires burning. You know, talking about God, God keeps the fires burning. No, He doesn't. He gives the fire as priests. We keep it burning. We, we've gotten so much into welfare Christianity, we want to sit back and enjoy the church service and let God keep the fire when that's the whole purpose of the priesthood. At that moment when that fire fell, because John the Baptist said he was going to come with the Holy Ghost and with what? With fire. That fire that was given for the original tabernacle given by Moses burned in three places. It burned in the outer court, at the altar. It burned with the, with the, at the, at the uh, menorah on the inside. It even burned with the incense. Incense is an incense until you light it. And could I say that prayer isn't prayer until it has the fire of God in it? And then the fire of God was at the throne of God in the Holy of Holies. 
at that moment on the day of Pentecost, God came back and he filled the Holy of Holies in those that were sitting there and brought the kingdom and brought fire. And what you see working through the book of Acts is what happens to a people that have the fire of God on the inside of them. Because one of the things that I question is, you know, in the temple in Jesus, the second temple period temple, the Holy of Holies was empty. And we know during the intertestamental period that the fire had gone out. The fire that was given by God. So even when they rededicated the temple, where'd that fire come from? The two guys rubbed sticks together until they got fire? It was man-made fire instead of the fire of God. So the whole time with the brazen altar and, 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 the, and the menorah on the inside was fire that very possibly had not been originated by God because we find nowhere in Scripture where God gave them the fire that they used in the second temple period. There's several things that we've got to look at here. Number one is baptism. Now let, let's go back and let's look at um, Acts chapter 1, verses 2 through 7. It says, Until the day which he was taken up after he, had, after he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. And there's a whole teaching series right there. Here the resurrected Savior still giving commandments. I'm sorry, I thought they had been done away with. No, a king will always have commandments flowing from his reign. If you do away with the commandments, you do away with the king. This saying, this chew on that for a while. To whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He's not talking just about salvation. What's he talking about? The kingdom of God, the gospel of the kingdom, the full rule and reign of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he saith, ye have heard of me, for John truly baptized you with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Now the Greek word there, baptismo, means to dip repeatedly, to immerse, to submerge, to cleanse by dipping uh, or submerging, to wash, to make clean with water, uh, to wash oneself, to bathe, to overwhelm. And if you've ever, you know, we've had baptismals here where we baptize people. You take them and they have got to completely give themselves over to the water. They go completely under the influence. They are overwhelmed by the water. And that water is in control. They're not in control. In fact, one of the, thing, one of the things that, one of the first things I was taught as a Baptist boy, being called to ministry, is they told us, now, you know, we, we use baptismals, but if you ever find yourself out in a stream where you're going to baptize, you have to work with the water. That if the stream is flowing this way, you baptize them down this way so the stream picks them back up. Because if you baptize them this way, the stream will try to end up in their nose and their mouth and everything else. And you may end up having them float on downstream. You have to work with the water. Okay? Oh, you're going to get this. You have to work with the water. What he was saying was, listen, from the moment that John the Baptist baptized me, I completely yielded to the voice and the, and the moving of the Holy Spirit to the place that whatever he said, I said. Whatever he did, I did. And if he wouldn't do anything, I wouldn't do anything. Even if he had me preach a sermon that made everybody leave. That happened several times to Jesus. That's what this baptism represents. A completely immersing in the kingdom, a complete immersing into the moving of the water of the Holy Spirit. That no longer am I being influenced by the Nakesh or the God of this world or the spirits that so easily affect our minds, but I have a greater reality. I am now connected to the third heaven and the throne of God. And there is a river that flows from that throne. 
And it's that river that I have waded down into the middle of and I have submerged myself in. And wherever the river of God takes me, that is where I'm going to go. I have chosen another kingdom and another river. But he didn't stop there. He said, when you receive, the, the, the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will, shall receive power. And everybody stops with dunamis, with miracle working power, but that's not the only definition, even in Strong's. Now listen to this. Strength, power, ability, and inherent power, power residing in a thing by virtue of its nature. We got a new nature, the nature of the kingdom or which a person or thing exerts or puts forth a power for performing miracles. Let's go deeper. Moral power and excellence of soul. Let's go deeper. The power or influence which belongs to riches and wealth. Go deeper. The power and resources arising from numbers. One will put a thousand to flight, two will put ten thousand to flight. Keep on going. Go deeper. Power consists or rests upon armies, forces, and hosts. He did not say, receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit and you'll get the power to speak in tongues. That's just one of the many things. You're going to receive strength, power, and ability... You're going to be able to move into miracles when that stream carries you that way. When the, when the current of the Holy Spirit moves you that way. But at the same time, that stream of the Holy Spirit is going to establish moral power and excellence of soul in you. And the first thing I thought of when, when I read that was how Daniel had a more excellent spirit. And so Christians that are tongue-talking, but they live like they're being taught by the devil, don't have the full baptism. It's got to affect you, spirit, soul, and body. Because what you see in the book of Acts is a greater hunger for the Word, a greater hunger for prayer, a greater love to see the kingdom of God, a greater hunger to see men come into the kingdom. That's all a part of it. And their integrity was intact, and it was so crucial that when two people decided that they were going to sell their property and, and, and tell everybody they gave it all to the church and gave a small portion, the Holy Spirit killed them over it. Because they were destroying the moral excellence of the early church. The power and influence that belongs to riches and wealth. Oh, you, you don't get it yet. You see, there's silver and gold on the earth. And there's riches of heaven. And the riches of heaven allow you to walk up to a man and say, silver and gold have I not, but what I do have, I give to you in the name of Jesus. Rise up and walk. While the Illuminati are exerting because of physical wealth, we have a greater wealth from a third heaven reality that can buy things and influence things that gold and silver can't. Are you getting happy yet? The power and resources rising from numbers. Oh, but brother, like I'm all alone. Oh, um, oh that, that's what I hear all the time. Let me tell you something. I've been all alone. Mary and I have been all alone. But what we found is we were never alone. Sometimes when we're alone because no one was standing with us, we have the biggest crowds that we could have. Angels. All gathered around the throne of God and I'm functioning from the throne of God. God, I'm in a crowd when I'm alone because there's a greater third heaven reality. Men will come and go. Mary and I found that out. A lot of people that we thought were friends. We told them, hey, the devil's after us and here's real proof of it. And they all went to the hills. 
When they left, they made room for something greater to show up. There was another army. Oh, you're going to get this. Why was Jesus, when, they were, when he went to, to Nazareth and preached at the beginning of his ministry, and he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me and preached to them. And he said, Now, this day is fulfilled in your hearing. He didn't say, Someday when the Messiah comes, or way back when Moses was here. He said, It's here now. You want it? And they rose up to stone him, and he walked right out of the midst of them. There was an army. He had an ambassadorial escort. We need to learn. Part of the baptism of the Holy Spirit is when I'm flowing in that river, I establish an ambassadorial escort around me to function in the kingdom. And as long as I stay true to the current of that river, because in the current of the river of God is all the provision for the kingdom of God that's flowing in that same current. Where we get into trouble is when we get into self-will and we step out of the baptism, we step out of the water, and we try to create our own current. Oh, I'm having fun. But it wasn't very long that Peter went back to almost what he asked, what they asked at the beginning before Jesus ascended. Let's go to Acts chapter 3, verses 19 through 23. You see, we forget it, and the church keeps on bad mouthing Moses. And Moses was the best example of Messiah in all of the Old Testament. He was the prototype. One's going to come just like me. And when God puts his words in his mouth just like me, you better obey those words because if you don't, you're going to be cut off. Now, to a certain degree, the Apostle Paul looks at that and says, many in Israel, because they reject the Messiah, were cut off to make room for you because you heard his voice and you started obeying. But there is a, there is a true fulfillment of that promise of Moses. When Jesus comes back, there's a little thing called the Valley of Armageddon. That is a fulfillment of the words of Moses. Now let's pick up here in Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Now notice the sequence. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of God, heaven is moving right now, this current is moving right now, how do you enter into the kingdom? You repent. Without repentance, you cannot move, you cannot come into the kingdom. It is repentance and coming under the blood, coming under what Messiah did for us. He said, you need to do it now while these times of refreshing are coming. Now look here at verse 21. Whom the heavens must receive until the times of restoration of all things. I was always taught as a Baptist that Jesus, the heavens are going to withhold Jesus until that last soul is saved. I'm more convinced that it's until that last soul is matured to the place they're functioning completely in the kingdom. Okay? Now restitution here and the Greek means restitution of a true theocracy of a perfect state before the fall. So in other words, we have taken the gospel of the kingdom and the lamb who was slain has received his full reward of the harvest that he's going to get out of planet earth and that the church is standing toe to the toe to the Antichrist and the Antichrist cannot fully overcome them. They have matured as much as they can mature and nothing else can be done but the bringing of His kingdom. Because the millennial reign is going to be a theocracy. How many know it's not going to be a democracy? Almighty God's going to be ruling and reigning on a throne from Jerusalem. Jeremiah tells us that if they don't recognize Him during the Feast of Tabernacles and don't honor Him during that time, their nation will have no reign that entire next year. Get a clue. 
But he goes, so he's going back now when Jesus is getting ready to come back and, and this is getting rid of this, this restitution of all things, it's connected to Moses. Imagine that. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, of that which God had given by the, by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began, for Moses saying unto the fathers, a prophet shall come, the, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever he shall say unto you and it shall come to pass that every soul that will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people when we get to the valley of armageddon i believe it's 10 days after the harpazo of the church the church is caught up those that are walking with god we celebrate a wedding feast, which lasts exactly 10 days. In those 10 days, God's wrath is poured out. When Jesus comes back, it's to a planet that has refused to hear his voice. And they're cut off. All those that refuse to hear will be at the Valley of Armageddon. They have raised up a transgenic horde to fight him with weapons beyond our belief. And he speaks a word. Now they, they refused his word that got him in this place. And the Bible says that a sword of fire comes out of his mouth. He speaks a word and they're gone. So we're someplace between Acts chapter 2 and the valley of Armageddon. And our job is to see to it that we live according to a theocracy. That really blows away most of Americanized church in which everybody believes that church is a democracy. You know, I, I was raised Baptist, and the old Baptist joke is the will of God can only be overturned by two-thirds of, of the vote of the people. No, it can't. That church will eventually be judged and have Ichabod written across the doorpost. And sometimes Michelob. You know, the old joke is, but how many churches, I've seen churches that have been closed down that ended up being taverns. So literally a fulfillment. God is wanting to restore. God is, God is calling us. And our job today, how are we going to get this done? Who are we going to have march on Washington? Here's how we're going to get it done. You have got to learn to yield to the voice of Messiah. You've got to learn how to be submerged into the kingdom. You've got to learn how to have that fire and maintain it. Because there's a lot of people around you that are dry kindling. Now for city dwellers, dry kindling is what you need to start a fire. And sometimes it just takes a little spark and dry kindling will catch on fire. And we wanted the preacher to do it. We wanted church services to do it. And what it is is a life lived in the kingdom will always do it. Because those that are destined to walk with God, when they get around the real thing, they begin hungering for it. Alcoholism falls off. Drug addiction begins to fall off. Bodies begin to get healed. Marriages begin to be restored. Lives begin to be turned around. And let me tell you something. Most of the body of Christ does not know what spiritual warfare is. What they're calling spiritual warfare is the stupid things that they are doing constantly comes back to roost and they call it spiritual warfare. That is not spiritual warfare. That is spiritual stupidity. Because we're living by the world and we're wondering why if you constantly plant the world, you're reaping the world. That's why understanding Torah is so important. As I renew my mind, I make my way prosperous. Then it's an outside force trying to steal my kingdom prosperity. Mm -hmm. Then that's spiritual warfare. Mm -hmm. But when you have ites within and ites without, and ites living in your living room, and ites living in your bedroom, and every part of your life, because you've invited them and you have planted them there, that is not spiritual warfare. That's when you need to hit your knees, repent, and begin to raise up in the kingdom and drive them out of your promised land by the power of God. 
Well, why won't God do it? Because God's waiting for you to rise up and say, I have had enough. Instead, we want, we want some preacher to come by with superpower that he can just lay his hands on my head and drive out all my ites. It never works that way. We can back them off for a moment so that we can teach you how to pick up a sword and how to wield it because each one of us have to drive out our own ites. That's part of the kingdom. And when you get ite free, you become a testimony. You become a witness of the kingdom. You know, Mary and I talk about, you know, years and years ago, it was like, oh yeah, come to church and accept Jesus and be miserable like us, you know. That's not a testimony. The testimony is when God does things in your life and why are you different? Here's why I'm different. I've accepted Jesus and I have learned how to walk in another kingdom. That old kingdom is killing you while my kingdom is renewing me. Come on. Then that is a testimony that we can take to Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all the earth. And it has the fire, and it's a life that is completely yielded to the kingdom. And it's a theocracy. Jesus is in charge, and we're not. The more I yield to him, the less influence the devil has. But the more I try to resist him, the more influence I give to the devil. And who's, who's the one who makes the decision about that? Me. I am. It's a part of the sanctification process that we have got to move beyond salvation into sanctification. Sanctification establishes the kingdom. And actually, that's what the, after the book of Acts, that's what the rest of the New Testament is about, is coming into the kingdom and learning sanctification and who I am in Christ. Not what the old kingdom of darkness says that I am, but who I am now in Christ. And it has to start out as a faithful servant. The just shall live by his faithfulness. Habakkuk tells us that the Apostle Paul quotes in the first book of Romans. My faithfulness to the covenant, my faithfulness to the kingdom, and my faithfulness to the king opens up greater levels of the kingdom in my life. Well, Father, we thank you today for your word. Father, my desire is that we would hunger and thirst after righteousness, that we would hunger and thirst after your kingdom, that we would hunger and thirst to, the, to be completely yielded to the water of the Holy Spirit, and that we would have the fire of God within. And Father, give us the wherewithal that we can properly maintain that fire, spirit, soul, and body in our lives. And we thank you and we praise you for it. In Jesus' name.